Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Keegan, and I am the Moynihan Assistant Professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Cultures at Barnard College. And it has been a pleasure to moderate this series of events. Welcome to the final event in our series about Kalilo Adimna, a collection of stories about uh, featuring fictive humans and talking animals. So thank you all for coming and a very special thank you uh, to the staff of the Columbia Global Center in Amman, um, especially Hania Salah, Farah Boudour, uh, Duna Dabbas and Ahmed Nusa, all of whom have been instrumental in making this event uh, series so successful. And the, this event series has had a truly global audience. There have been people coming in from all over the world, which I think is particularly appropriate for such a global text. Uh, let me briefly catch you up on where we have been over the past few weeks. Uh, the tales of Khalidu Adimna have traveled from Sanskrit to Middle Persian to Arabic and Syriac, and then from Arabic into languages all across the world, from French and English to Malay and Japanese. Um, there was a, there's also a lot of variation between Arabic versions of Khalidu Adimna. So many copyists felt free to adapt augment and adjust the text as they went. In the keynote a few weeks ago, uh, Beatrice Grundler introduced Kalila Adimna and discussed the ERC-sponsored project about Kalila that is ongoing at the Freie Universität in Berlin. That project, entitled Anonym Classic, is made up of over a dozen researchers, programmers, and staff all working towards a synoptic edition of Kalila Adimna. So one where different versions of the text in Arabic can be seen side by side and also to understand the transmission of Khalilu Adzimna across languages. In the first workshop after the keynote, we learned about the digital aspects of the project. In the second workshop, we heard about the adaptations and translations of Khalilu Adzimna. And today we will be discussing the Arabic versions of Khalilu Adzimna. And so one of the big focuses of the Anonym Classic Project has been to understand the ways in which the, the text was rewritten in Arabic. Um, and our first presentation today is by Beatrice Grundler, the principal investigator of the Khalilu Adimna Anonym Classic Project. She is the professor and chair of the Arabic department at the Freie Universität, and she has written numerous books and articles on Arabic literature. Our second presentation comes from Khulud Khalfallah. Uh, Khulud has been one of the key manuscript transcribers for the project. She is a research associate and a master's student at the Freie Universität in Arabic studies. And before Berlin, she studied commerce and worked in financial engineering in Tunisia. Uh, the third presentation is by Johannes Stefan, a postdoctoral research fellow in Berlin. He has a PhD from the University of Bern in Switzerland, where he wrote about the travelogue of Hannah Dieb, which was one of uh, Galan's sources for his augmentation of the Arabian Nights in French. Uh, finally, our discussant today is Devin Stewart. He is Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies at Emory, and he has published a very, very long list of articles on all sorts of subjects, Arabic literature, Quranic studies, Shiism, um, as well as numerous edited books and, uh, and a monograph on Shiism. Um, and we welcome you all to uh, the presentations today. Um, now, before we start, there is a Q&A box, which you can access uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which means that you can ask questions as we go. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A box, and at the end of the presentations, we're gonna, have, we're gonna feed those questions to our, I will be in charge of feeding those questions to our presenters. And if we don't get to your question, we will have a readout of that Q&A box, so we will be able to get in touch with you and answer some questions after the event. Um, and we are live tweeting this at hashtag digital Kalila. And just so you all know, this event is recorded. Now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Beatrice Grundler. Hello, and uh, thank you, Matt. And I'm um, very glad to be here to tell you a bit about uh, the manuscript and what happens. Now, the manuscripts of Kalila Wadimna present a confusing picture. The work behaves differently than from what we're used to in classical Arabic literature. Uh, the, the versions differ greatly and Khulul Khalfala is going to talk about that. 
And the language shifts between classical Arabic and a mixture of different versions about which Johannes Stefan is going to tell you more. This is a work that once belonged to the model genres of classical Arabic prose, and it was one of the earliest works of Adab. And um, it has changed since considerably. Now I'm going to show you my PowerPoint, um, tell you a bit more about what uh, we do. You don't need to read all of this, but uh, I, um, all of us, need a complex DH infrastructure to keep all our many, many different forms of dates in shape. Our method is comparison and observation, not reconstruction. You won't get a critical, unique edition from us ever, rather one with many um, simultaneous versions, probably in columns. And you want to document and analyze, not reconstruct. Now, our basic question is, when we look at the manuscript, how they relate to each other, meaning um, how does any individual manuscript relate to any other, how distant or close are they? And then what makes a, any given manuscript unique? Because we're also interested in the people, known or unknown, who produced those manuscripts. Now, the variations between the manuscripts are so drastic that um, we cannot simply go into the text and compare. We had to um, pull in a second sort of a bird's eye level of analysis by cutting texts into segments and then first comparing our entire passages or paragraphs uh, present in different manuscripts. Not whether they're the same, but do manuscripts speak about the same steps of the action. Uh, and those two things which we then compared in the manuscripts, the sections, show that uh, the manuscripts can be placed into what we call continua, which means manuscripts hang uh, closely together, but to um, diverge minimally from the one to the other. Belonging to one continuum, however, does not mean that this manuscript therefore nicely plays along with the other manuscript it belongs to. Rather, knowing that manuscripts belong to a continuum is a sort of backdrop. So passages recur that we can identify, but then in between other passages, that are totally different. And that is the particular type, this alternating copying and creating and copying and creating that makes um, the type of variance in Kalila Wadimna. Sometimes we are lucky and in a continuum, two manuscripts are very close to each other as regards the shared text, but then we can in manuscript number two, um, to identify what is really unique to manuscript two. And this is why continua are also important, not just to group manuscript, but then to see the runaways. Some of the copyists do that. Uh, but to give you a picture, so this is, uh, these are just names and figures, but each one of those lines is a paragraph in a manuscript. And this is our bird's eye view. And you can already see, so each column of numbers is a manuscript. And the number there means that manuscript has a particular paragraph. And don't worry about understanding the whole thing, but just look at the holes. That, this is all the places where not all manuscripts share one paragraph. And there are quite a number of holes, as you can see. Now, when we go a little bit further, we can see or we zoom in, what we will now do, zoom in uh, on the left side into two of those uh, segments. It's number eight, I'll show them to you in large. This is our edition tool. 
it has the bird's eye view in little blocks. So the top um, horizontal uh, line shows uh, which segments are present in a particular manuscript and the bottom then uh, you can look into the text of them. And if you briefly glance at the top, you can see that the top lines are a lot longer than the bottom lines. But, and, and these are our two continua. These larger structural differences then allow us to base the, to distinguish the continua while within each, there are still differences. So no, almost no manuscript is like any other. There are some cases, but they are the exceptions. But if you look um, to the bottom, which I will make a little bit bigger for you, here we have one um, example of two um, sections that define the two manuscripts. On the left side, you see the, um, what we call the Paris continuum. And the Paris continuum um, in the preface of Ibn Muqaffa is very interested in explaining how the parables work. Well, a parable is a thing that you have to decode. You have to not just uh, read it superficially, but you have to go inside and, and decode analogically what is meant. So the text on the left three columns, as you will see, is not identical, but it is very close. And it begins, and then towards the bottom is, um, and then so we have some um, specific logical vocabulary. We have muqaddimat and nataish, and the reader is supposed to look at the fables and decode them. That, that's important in the Paris continuum. Then you go to the next um, item, it's reader to reflect. In the London continuum, the parables are not so much talked about, but it's rather the reading process uh, that is explained. So here, this unit, um, the third columns on the right, explain that uh, this has to be awalu ma yanbari li ma talaba hadal kitab an yabtadi fi fihi bi jawdati qiraatihi wa tathabut. So the reader has to be slow and, and detailed and think about it. Um, you may have noticed I have not spoken about the manuscript that differs from both, which is in the middle. Um, this one um, has more elements and different elements, and I, I come back to that later. Now, if you go then further, and uh, this is just to show you a little bit of the, um, how this is done. So we do have computers, but a lot of it happens with pencils and highlighters. Uh, here I have zoomed in towards the end of uh, the continuum you see on the uh, four right columns that the long end is missing in what we define as the London continuum. And if you put it sideways here, the, the blue box shows um, the added segments, and they are mainly additional stories, as uh, this version adds a lot of sub-stories. And the, pref the um, one segment towards the end explaining four different authorships of um, the book, namely children, uh, rulers, copyists and illustrators, here as uh, beneficiaries of the book production, and its ongoing circulation. And I think that was uh, very um, prescient since the book is still circulating. The earliest uh, manuscript containing um, this preface is from the 13th century. And the fourth group of um, audience yeah, are philosophers. Now, we come back to the mysterious middle manuscript. And this manuscript exhibited a phenomena none that we were, um, we became aware of through juxtaposing and comparing the manuscripts. Uh, 
And uh, this was rather hard to believe in the beginning because I was wondering how can this happen? Why does this manuscript combine phrases from different continua? So this manuscript combines something that not, does not appear in any single other manuscript, but combines. And through a segment by segment comparison, we basically looked at our copyist's fingertips. This is um, this manuscript uh, from the Bibliothèque Nationale 5881. Um, it also has an insipid that um, has been copied a couple of times, but it explains very nicely what each chapter contains. It's like a mode of instruction, if you will, a very long, peculiar insipid. But uh, the example I want to show you, so you can sort of track it, is the long voyage of Burzoi going to India. And that is one of the prefaces that explains the import of the book from India to Iran on a sort of secret spy mission. And before the king picks the person to do so, he describes him and on the um, right side, you see rightmost side with the many colors, you see our um, combined manuscript, the Paris manuscript. And then by juxtaposing other manuscripts, you can tell how, where he has picked his ingredients from. Um, the Paris continuum is all the blue and a very early manuscript, Pocock, uh, it's one that gives us many sleepless nights because uh, it was very creative uh, copyist. From uh, this manuscript, we could identify other portions. And this was not random. This was very targeted, as, as you can tell. Uh, here, I've just pulled out a very few statements. The um, combining manuscript takes the beginning from Pocock uh, here. It is stated the perfect scholar for the mission is either a scribe or a physician. Then from the Paris continuum, the copies takes, he must have add up and have read philosophical books. Now, so far unique to um, the Paris manuscript, although unique is always to be taken with a grain of salt. Tomorrow we can find another manuscript and it's in there, so it's no longer unique. So unique is really a working assumption, but we need it in order to narrow more and more and more what is peculiar to one manuscript. So, so far, uh, only in this manuscript, the person also pursues speculation and exegesis. Totally anachronistic, but to at the time of the copyist, these were important um, intellectual pursuits. And the end, the advisors went out, and uh, our manuscript adds they actually found such a man. Now, this is one way of cross copying with very small pieces, mosaic like, and um, other. Uh, manuscripts do this in either in big blocks or on the margins or with uh, in many, many further techniques that would take too long to explain. But just to say that the copyists we are studying were just as smart as we are and they um, freely recombined and recreated new versions out of previous versions. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Beatrice, for that uh, presentation. I think it's really interesting to see how a copyist can interweave different versions, sort of pick and choose these different versions from prior manuscripts. I think that's uh, a really great visualization of what's going on. Um, and now we have a presentation by Khulud. Khulud, it's up to you. So hello everybody, my topic today is an overview of the variety of versions of Kedira Vadimna. Since we have almost 100 manuscripts in our project, we have been trying to classify them to reach some kind of clarity about how manuscripts are hanging together. So in this presentation, I'm going to present three examples and show you how we have been able to uh, identify them. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Is it visible for you? Okay. Yes. 
So uh, let's start with our first group, which is uh, the RIA 2536 group or the DREAM group. So uh, this version is represented by uh, these two main manuscripts. The first one is RIA 2536, dated to the 14th century. And we also have Istanbul 344, dated to the 11th century, which is probably not the actual dating. And we also have two other manuscripts in this version. The first one is Paris 3478, dated to the, 8th, to the 18th century and very close to Istanbul. And we have London uh, Bridge Library 3900, uh, dated also to the 18th century and very close to Riyadh. So those manuscripts are in most parts very close to the Castilian versions. Their text uh, is very close, their composition is very close, and also the chapter sequences are similar. So they all have the chapter sequence E in which the King and Dreams uh, chapter is inserted into the Mahabharata block between second and third tale. So many passages made us aware of this big similarity between this group and the Castilian version, especially a key narrative passage located at the beginning of the King and Dreams story. This passage um, comes just after the king woke up and includes a detailed description of visions he saw while sleeping. So the passage is usually introduced by Wakana Ra'a Fi Manani or Wakana Ra'a. And then we have here an enumeration of dreams he had. So this dreams description is absent in the majority of Arabic manuscripts. Few documents only have uh, this shared, this, uh, this unit. And most of, him, uh, of them also share the same uh, chapter sequence. So this passage is present in the Castilian, also in the older Hebrew and uh, also in the Latin version. So those group of manuscripts uh, also have the chapter of the two kingfishers and Wimbrel. So Babel al Romain and Mirsam. Um, and the, the chapter of the two kingfishers and Wimbrel is a space chapter and it appears only in Old Hebrew, Latin and Castilian. In Arabic, it exists as far as we know only in those manuscripts, so in 13 manuscripts. And after analyzing the chapter, we found out that we have uh, different groups and different versions. And this made us realize the diversity within the group itself. So um, the version of Paris 3471 um, is very unique and it has a different ending than all others. And um, uh, so we, we, we have been uh, uh, through this uh, able to identify this group what we call now the uh, Paris 3471 group. So this group is composed of uh, nine manuscripts. The earlier ones are Chester Beatty from the 16th century and Paris 3471 from the 17th century. The problem with Chester Beatty is that it's just a fragment. It's not a complete manuscript. For all others, they are complete and they include more or less the same text except for some insignificant changes. So now let's take a look at uh, the Paris 3471 version. So this version is uh, the result of a very fine cross copying work. In this segment, for example, from the King and Dreams chapter, the copyist, or rather the redactor, is taking some parts from this manuscript here, the Parker manuscript, and putting them here, and also taking other parts from the Riyadh manuscript and putting them, uh, them here. So for example, in, in this unit, the philosopher is mentioning the best quality a king must have. And um, here, the copyist took al-mar'a al-saliha al-fadila al-ra'i and put it in his text. And then uh, he, uh, uh, he chose from here al-karam, al-helm, forgiveness and uh, generosity. So al-helm, muhafid al-helm al-karam, wa madat al-karam, mushawarat ahl al-aqd. And he took all this and put it is, uh, in, in his uh, text. So this example shows us how the copyist is using the two texts to, um, to make his own version. In addition to this two combined, uh, this text combined from these two manuscripts from the 14th century, 
We also have some unique passages and we are still uncertain about the origin of this, uh, this part. So we don't, learn, we don't know if um, the copyist um, uh, added them by himself or if we do have a third for Lager. And first we were very surprised about how many manuscripts are directly related to this manuscript, to the Paris 3471 manuscript. Uh, because um, verbatim copies or copies are not the tradition uh, in Kalila with Dimna. But when we saw how unique this, uh, uh, this version is, we understood why it's so popular. So I'm trying now to capture this uniqueness through some, um, some versions or some examples. I want to show you, for example, this uh, uh, citation by Lokman in Ring Dove chapter. Um, so in, uh, in this quotation, uh, uh, Lokman's son asked him father about the worst thing that can happen. So, uh, and his father, or Lokman, answered him, uh, when a dishonorable man disintegrates uh, a generous man. So, قَالَ لَوْ عَلَى الكريم. And the point of this addition is to initiate people to be generous to one another. We have also here a second example, uh, is a, st a story of uh, Solomon and the Phoenix about uh, fate and predestination. So this story is found in the King and Bird chapter. And uh, this is one of the largest additions in this version. It has the form of um, a sub story and it has a title here marked uh, in the left margin uh, with um, here uh, the time or the period when the story happened. So Sadara fi zaman Sulaiman ibn Dawood, Nabiullah alayhi salam. And then we have also um, the characters of the story, so Sulaiman, and here Waqa'a ma'al anqa, and we have the subject also, fil qada wal qadr. So such marginal titles are usually uh, very short. Uh, this one is probably more detailed to emphasize the historical uh, and religious significance of the story, or maybe also to highlight it as uh, an addition of, um, of the copyist. This story, uh, by the way, have also been found in, in Wairi's book. Um, and uh, I think this is one of the famous story in, in, the, in the Islamic uh, literature. So we have here our third and last example for this group, which is a, a sub story again, and three verses of poetry. We found it in the chapter of the Ois and Crows. The sub story is about the king who decided to kill his wise advisor, although he saved him from his illness. So the ungrateful king was then killed by this same advisor who managed to poison him with a book he offered him before his death. The dying king then pronounces the, the, uh, those three verses of poetry we have here. Uh, uh, they are attributed to Al-Imam al-Shafi'i and the king tried to confirm that what goes around comes around. So, هذا بذاك ولا عتب على الزمن. This story also has been uh, found in some versions of Alf Layla wa Layla as Hikayat al-Wazir al-Muhtal. So, let's move now to our third group, which is uh, the Queen group. So um, the Queen group is based on one uh, manuscript, which is uh, this one here, Paris Arab 3466 from the 15th century and held at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. This manuscript is different from all others since it's swinging between London and Paris continua. It seems that the version of Paris 3466 uh, uh, has inspired copyists to, to make modifications and uh, to change it. So uh, those modifications um, are in form of a big number of unique narrative elements. And they have been added to the text uh, of Paris uh, and appear in many manuscripts with the same composition. 
So some of those manuscripts are copy of each other, some others are slightly written but close to the basic text, but most of the manuscripts have the same chapter sequence. And the oldest manuscript of, from this group is uh, the Paris Arab 3468 from the 16th century, uh, which seems also to be a copy from another because we have a muqabala here, and we have it also in many other um, pages of uh, the manuscript. So nine out of 11 manuscripts belonging to the Queen group has also uh, um, have also the King of the Mice chapter. Um, the, the King of the Mice chapter is also a space chapter. We have it in the old Syriac, it's very old. We have it in the Greek and in the New Persian. In Arabic, the chapter uh, exists only in 15 manuscripts, those manuscripts here. One manuscript is from the 12th, 13th century, Hagia Sophia. And we have here our group of manuscripts. So the Queen group, they also have this chapter. So in the King and Dreams chapter, um, this subgroup enlarge the position of the Queen. Uh, they present her as uh, the wisest and the prettiest woman. This enlargement took place already in the original version, it means in Paris 3, 4, uh, 6, 6. So that's why we call the whole group the Queen group. And um, here's some additions found in the King and Dreams chapter. They are from different manuscripts from the 16th to the 19th century. Uh, for instance, here, for example, uh, when the Indian king went to visit the sage, the sage, the sage interpreted his visions while the king knelt before him. So this action in the queen group is, uh, is, is more specific. Here we have It means he knelt before him to greet him and not as a sign of adoration. So another example is here, for example, when the, when the queen serves her husband uh, a bowl of rice she holds in her hand. Uh, here we have um, the bowl uh, described as made of uh, saphir. So فقامت إبرخت على رأس الملك وفي يدها صحفة المليقود. In all other manuscripts, except the queen group, they have the, uh, a bowl of gold. So صحفة من الذهب. Here another example from the Queen group. Uh, this example is from Paris 3468 uh, in the Oils and Crows chapter. The additions here marked in red color are um, vary in size from some words to a paragraph. So depending on the passage where, where they appear. These additions usually don't change the plot and the purport of the chapter but they show that copyists were inspired to, uh, to engage with the text and, and to enhance it. So finally, I would like to say that um, we have many other very interesting um, versions of Kalila Wedimna, but to keep my presentation short today, I had to, um, I had to take this three, but I will be happy to discuss more about this and to answer your questions later. Thank Great. you. Khulud, before you take away your presentation, could you explain Mokabala? You said um, okay. there's a Mokabala note in one of your manuscripts, but I... Yeah, we, we have here, I don't know if you, can, uh, if you can see it, but it's a Mokabala. It means we have another manuscript and the copyist uh, copy the same text from another manuscript and somebody else or the, um, the copyist itself try to verify this. Right. Try. So it's, a, it's a note about checking the manuscript against exactly. its against its yeah. forlaga. Okay, great. Right. Okay, um, thank you so much. And keep the questions coming in the Q and A box. Uh, I'm sure that we will get to them. And now we have a presentation by Johanna Stefan. Yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, especially to you, the organizers, and Matt, of course, for giving us this opportunity to talk about our research. Um, I'm a postdoc in the Khalil Dimna project and mainly working on the indirect transmission and recently I started to develop another sub-project which deals with the linguistic variation um, under the title of Middle Arabic and now 
I'm trying to share um, trying to share my screen. So yeah, our project, as you've heard already during the last weeks, deals with the variance within the Kalila and Dimna tradition. I call it a tradition as I think calling it simply a book, like one book or a text, does not do justice to the extremely diverse material that we're dealing with. The two previous presentations engaged with the tradition's different versions to reconstruct the textual history and its different strains and relations. In my presentation now, I will shift the focus a little bit to the question, what this variance signifies. And I will look at this aspect from the perspective of linguistic features, especially those features that we usually call Middle Arabic. For Kalila Wadimna does not only vary from copy to copy in terms of narrative content or the order of the chapters, but also in terms of its linguistic constitution. So with regard to the Arabic, we can say, no text simply reproduces the other. I would like to suggest that the linguistic variation is significant as another layer of textual instability. And I argue it demonstrates how Kalila Wadimna functions as a literary and open text tradition. Its poetic moments, I further argue, reside in the fact that each and every copyist alters form, style, linguistic outlook, and content of the text he reproduces. As much as narrative variance, linguistic variance is an inherent part of the tradition. Before expounding on the book's literary aspect, I will first define Middle Arabic very briefly and then show you some conspicuous features in a selection of witnesses. Under the widely discussed term Middle Arabic, I understand a written register which rests between what is known as Fusha, you could call it the pure language, or the classical standard, on the one hand, and the Arabic dialects on the other. Middle Arabic is historical, as it had probably existed since the beginning of Arabic writing up until the impact of Arabic print during the turn to the 20th century, um, and is of hardly any use today. Especially in the early modern Ottoman period, to which 80%, uh, roughly 80% of the manuscript copies we um, have collected um, reproductions of so far, date, Middle Arabic features were of a broad use in different milieus and textual traditions. The register is used to depict the language of single texts. That is to say that in a Middle Arabic text, not everything is Middle Arabic. All of the texts subsumed under this register contain to a more or less extent aspects from the classical standard intermingled with the lexicon, the orthography, morphology and the syntax from Arabic dialects and besides historical writing conventions, which can be called pseudo or hypercorrections. Hence, Middle Arabic is a broad spectrum that ranges from text with a few orthographic and lexicographic peculiarities to an almost distinct vernacular register. It has been established, especially by the linguist Jérôme Lantin, that Middle Arabic is more than just a collection of features and of oddities um, and defi deficiencies, but that it is a register with an idiomatic status, which many writers made a deliberate use of. I will showcase through some examples how this observation also holds for the variation between the individual Kalila and Dimna copies. I will start these examples with the most commonly known orthographic features and move then on to more specific features, including syntactic ones. All examples are taken from the chapter of the king and his eight dreams that you've already um, heard a little bit about, which is also presented as the chapter on the virtue of Helen, forbearance. In this chapter, an Indian king is tormented by an interpretation of his own dreams that, predicts, uh, that predict the necessary killing of his court and family members and his best um, court animals. A typical orthographic element is the omission of Hamza, the letter representing a glottal stop, which is of little use in Arabic dialects, and um, the omission of diacritics in certain consonants. These two manuscripts from London and the famous Hagia Sophia manuscript, which is most probably the oldest copy of Kaila Udinna we know of so far, are very likely to stand in a relation of filiation. In this case, they contain an almost identical text, 
The Hamza is not indicated on top of the alif in the word ra'a, nor as an initial consonant in the word ahlam, which means dreams. Both versions occasionally replace the dal by dal, however, they do it at different points. Now I am coming to one of the two manuscripts that I will have a closer look at. This one, uh, written most probably by a Christian scribe in late 17th or early 18th century in the Levant, is part of the Spat collection, of which a big part is today um, still in the Vatican Apostolic Library. In the Spat manuscript, the replacement of interdentals such as dal by dal and also tha by ta occurs on almost every page. I'm juxtaposing this manuscript here with two others that in any way, directly or indirectly, are among the predecessors or the Vorlagen, as we call it, of this manuscript. Typically, for Middle Arabic text, the exchange of letters can also turn the other way around. This is what one could call pseudo-corrections. Instead of writing that or the reduced form dat, as in the two other manuscripts from London and Paris, the Vatican manuscript replaces the ta this time by a tha. Thus has it, if you read it out loud, daf. Whereas the more frequent use of ta can be explained by features of the copyist dialect, in this case, a phonetic consideration is rather unlikely. Instead, the scribe may have been aware that some of the ta he uses should actually be spelled tha so that he ends up changing the outlook of either letter in both directions. This change of letters is part of Middle Arabic variation and often is of an almost systematic use, you could say, in, at least in some manuscripts. The copyist may have known or um, listened to the stories from one of the three other versions, um, from Istanbul, London, or Paris that I've um, shown to you now, but still chose his own way of writing. A similar thing happens with vocalization. To remain, first of all, a little bit in the story, since the king is traumatized by the interpretation of dreams carried out by vengeful and evil Brahmans, the king's first vizier takes action, begging the king's wife to go and see what is going on with her spouse. The scribe of the Vatican manuscript changes both the content and the linguistic outlook of his text. This is the only one among the above quoted manuscripts, manuscript copies that vocalizes um, some words of this passage with U, the Dhamma. In a Fusha text, both times the vowel sign would indicate the case of the noun determined by the preceding preposition. Yet the scribe of the Vatican manuscript chose, if speaking from the Fusa perspective, chose the wrong case. This type of vocalization, which occurs a few times more in this chapter of this manuscript um, and within direct um, quoted speech, must be the outcome of a colloquial use. Ala sirru or an amru. As with the use of certain letters instead of others shown above, manuscripts like this seem to interact with the practice of oral performance. It is either that the copyist may have had a previous situation of listening to the story in mind and vocalized accordingly, or he wrote for the purpose of such future performance. It is rather unlikely that he simply was not able to use another um, or more standard register as he um, chose to vocalize his text. An even more performative character can be supposed with a Wettstein manuscript from the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. In this manuscript, which is for the most part unvocalized, we can often observe orthographic, morphological and syntactic, as well as lexicographic peculiarities, which I have highlighted here in different colors. Um, um, this time here occurring within a few lines. In this passage, the manuscripts from Paris and Riyadh contain minor orthographic features, which for the sake of clarity, I haven't highlighted here. Whereas the use of non-classical orthography is rather moderate in the Wettstein manuscript, depicted on the right, its writer adds words and phrases to the direct speech of the vizier, which contains several syntactic peculiarities. Among the colored features here, only the green one can be found in earlier versions from Paris and Riyadh. 
since Arabat avoids vocalization, this additional letter um, may emphasize the dialogue with the female addressed. Albeit irritating for the modern reader, for the one listening to the text, this does not make a big, if at all, any difference. The same applies to the use of anti or inti. Other features on the morphological level do reflect um, in the reading out loud of this manuscript copy and stem from a colloquial fashioning. The copyist writes the second person feminine of to know without a final n, nun, talami instead of talamina. And on the syntactic level, the writer makes use of an accusative form in mahmuman, mahmuman, um, indicated um, by the final alif instead of the no nominative um, expected in a phrase introduced by Anna. This use of an alif with tanwin is the only visible case to highlight the specific status of a predic predicate and to accentuate its role. Another syntactic feature is, is the ascendetic um, connection of, um, of two verbs such as here, achav, and um, a verb, yakunu, negated with la, um, achav la yakunu, which is reminiscent of spoken colloquial grammar in which conjunctions between verbs do occur less frequently as in the classical standard. As you can see in this longer passage, Rabat also extends and dramatizes the narrative's emotional dimension by repeatedly referring to this to the minister's fear and his strong bond, bond with his king, etc. It is in these passages that he makes more frequent use of Middle Arabic syntax. Arabat was a book owner and writer and scribe who had several volumes of popular literature in his library, among these copies of the Arabian Nights and popular epics. Although Arabat had his hands on another Kalilandimna copy, which is in London today, from the 18th century, he did not seem to make much use of this version for his own rewriting. So this is a preliminary list of features of the two manuscripts and this, this specific chapter I have been talking about now, which I cannot go through now in detail, of course, but of which um, of some, some of these um, you've seen already. Arabat, like the copies of the Vatican manuscript, that is, by the way, anonymous, um, mentioned above, must have had access to different written versions and was at the same time familiar with the flexibility of Kalila and Dimna, probably also due to its oral performances. You can see here in the middle of this table those features that are rather frequent in both manuscript copies. However, here you can see that they do not share so many frequent features on the syntactic level. Now let me draw some final remarks on what to make of these variations. It is remarkable, first of all, that both writers, although having produced to a large extent Middle Arabic Kalila and Dimna manuscripts, have their own linguistic peculiarities. What I attempted to show with my contribution on details in the orthographic and syntactic variation, both within and between different manuscripts, is an aspect of pre-modern and early modern literary culture. Textual variance does not only hold for narrative recomposition, but seems to be a main characteristic of an open text tradition such as Kalila Wadimna. The often um, occurring change of words, letters, vowels, and syntactic structures is not an exception. It seems to be rather the rule. How can we make sense of this? Each manuscript as a rewriting or a recomposition becomes a literary event in its own terms. The Scottish physician and traveler to Aleppo, Patrick Russell, describes the recitation of Eastern fables, as he calls it, as a practice in which the speaker grants the stories, I quote, an air of novelty even to persons who at first imagine they're listening to tales with which they are acquainted, end of quote. This perspective on narrative recomposition does also apply at least to some extent, I think, to the linguistic refashioning and might help us reformulate the significance of Middle Arabic. The Middle Arabic idiom reminds the reader of the artistry of Arabic by bringing together the language of everyday life with a Fusha standard. Middle Arabic then is middle because it mediates the poetic or artistic language to the spoken word, the oral narrative. 
In this regard, neither one of the two written registers, but their entanglement is the artful experience when one is confronted with the variants of these early modern texts. Along the formulation of the Russian formalist Viktor Shklovsky, reading or listening to Kalila Vodimna involves a defamiliarization, which is the art of presenting familiar things in a new, unfamiliar fashion in order to enhance the perception of the familiar. I quote, the goal of art is to create the sensation, sensation of seeing, and art is the means to live through the making of a thing, end of quote. The creative rewriting of a text or the replacement of a word from one register with a word from another register helps foster the reader's or listener's focus on certain moments of the narrative or the individual making of the text altogether. According to Shklovsky, artful language breaks the conventions of everyday prose and prolongs the reader's experience. In the tradition of Kalila Wadimna as a piece of classical Arabic literature initially, however, the narrative and the text have already become the familiar, or it is quite probable that it became the familiar. It is thus the job of the performer or the writer, copyist, to defamiliarize the material, even in the slightest detail. Therefore, every copyist, by adding certain narrative and or linguistic features, makes the reader hear the story world in a hitherto unknown fashion. I suggest to call this aspect of constant defamiliarization the poetic moment. These poetic moments, of course, can have different degrees, um, but it is these poetic moments that seem to occur again and again, at least until the 19th century, when um, Sylvestre de Sassy's first complete critical edition, according to more or less modern standards, um, became um, the origin of, or became the, the basis for many um, modern editions, at least until the early 20th century. Um, and I think it is until the 19th century um, that this degree, high, relatively high degree of variation um, is the rule. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johannes. And uh, we still have lots of interesting questions in the Q&A box. Please feel free to add uh, questions as they occur to you, since we have now heard all of the presentations. Um, we will, uh, you know, the pres presenters are also welcome to check on these questions so they have an idea of where the discussion is going. One thing I wanted to add is that there is a open source progress report uh, for the Anonym Classic project, which can be found at the link in the chat box uh, in the journal Medieval Worlds. Uh, a lot of the questions about illustrations and uh, some of the methodology questions can be found in this uh, in this progress report. Um, so if we don't get to them, uh, you might be interested in checking out the Medieval World's progress report. And now, without further ado, thank you, Devin Stewart, for coming to uh, discuss these presentations with us, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Grundler and everyone involved with the Anonym Classic Project for asking me to do this. It's a pleasure. It's a fascinating topic. And I have uh, just a few remarks um, I was asked to be somewhat critical and I'm having a hard time being critical. It, it, the amount of work that is involved in this is actually mind boggling. It's uh, much larger than anything we usually undertake in our field when editing manuscripts. And it is a level, level of complexity far above what we usually we usually do. The only thing I can think of to compare this with is uh, editing the New Testament. Right? It's like a huge project of uh, many, many versions. And it has some similarities. One is like the, the, the large number of manuscripts, the large number of languages into which things were translated. Um, also, the synoptic problem that you have in the New Testament where you have versions in which paragraphs have been moved around and placed and, and glommed together is, reminds me uh, of this. With this though, there's an added complication in that the editors felt much freer to add, subtract, combine, and be 
whereas with the New Testament, you assume they didn't feel such a freedom and they were trying to stick to, to tradition much more strictly. So it's even more complicated than the New Testament uh, example in some ways. Um, the progress so far is very impressive and, and I particularly like the, the two um, concepts that uh, Professor Grimler talked about, the continua and the cross copying, right? This is a way to get at these large families that don't actually work out the way a normal stemma codicum works out, you know, the exact family of manuscripts, but, um, but that to recognize that we do have groups of manuscripts that share certain features and have been transmitted somehow in uh, concert with each other. I, I love the concept of the runaway, right? I mean, that even within these families, a particular editor can just take what he has in front of him and decide, no, I'm gonna do something completely different, which, which is usually not what happens when you are looking at other types of texts. Um, the cross copying concept is also important, and uh, you may have explained this in other events, but the usual term for this has been contamination, right? And it's seen as something, you know, a problem that needs to be gotten rid of, right? And it's very clear in this tradition that you're treating it in a positive way and sort of using that to understand how the redactors and editors have been acting. Uh, Khalud gave some very good examples of sort of smaller families of manuscripts and what they share and how they differ from other families. And uh, so this is another important contribution of the project, just recording what these variations are and, and understanding the historical development of each of these uh, substrands within, within the whole transmission of uh, Kedila Wadimna. There's something else though, this gets at, this gets at something I consider sort of more, a uh, more difficult thing to, realize it's not just uh, recording what happened, but also getting at the mind of the redactor, right? So there's an element, a very strong element in this project of redaction criticism, trying to understand what the editors were thinking when they did what they did, which uh, requires uh, a speculation, but also, but also is a very interesting and, and difficult uh, process, but ultimately, I believe, rewarding that this will be uh, an important contribution of, of the project. Um, about Middle Arabic, uh, so the, there's a whole field of Middle Arabic, and uh, I guess I'd like to take this opportunity to, to criticize some of the field. I'm not gonna uh, criticize Johannes uh, specifically, but there's, there's a, everything that was said was correct. It's sort of middle in between two registers of, of Arabic. It's the written phenomenon, right? Uh, there's an idea that it's restricted to historical periods and that it is not done now, right? I would, I would like to suggest that it is done now. Uh, if you look at private letters, you know, letters that people write from the village to whatever, and, and it may be more pronounced with people who don't have full control of classical Arabic, you will see many of the features that you consider, uh, that are considered Middle Arabic, and that can happen today, uh, and it certainly happened throughout the 20th century. Right? Now we have somewhat similar phenomenon, although it's a bit different on the internet where people are writing in, in various forms of English letters in Arabic, you know, which is somewhat, you can say that's different, but there's some of the same kinds of features 
that you will find on online. Um, the other thing that I'm not sure I'm in agreement with is this idea of strange this, that it's sort of making making strange uh, the text of Khalil and Wadimna. The thing about Middle Arabic is in a way is more familiar to people who are not used to using uh, classical Arabic, right? It's sort of the intrusion of the familiar ways of saying things into, into writing, right? And that is, seems weird from the point of view who of, of foreign students of Arabic, right? And, and also people who are entirely committed to the purity of the classical language are uh, offended by these intrusions of, of a colloquial register into, into the text. So I, I might argue that it's, it's not so strange except for those, those people who consider it a violation or who haven't been exposed to the dialect to begin with because they uh, are Persian speakers or they're, you know, Urdu speakers or, or they are uh, people like us studying Arabic from, from uh, outside the Arab world. Um, the, uh, I'd just like to point out that, that the identification of these elements is often not a simple process. And so uh, Stefan Johannes presented it as a fairly straightforward process. You check it and he found very, very good examples. But let's say if you have the phrase that was originally that Leila, right? One night, right? On a certain night. And it's spelled with a D, a D, right? D, the letter D instead of a V, right? So you, you would read it that. You often don't know what that represented, right? It could just represent that Leila and the dot was left out, which often happens in manu manuscripts. It could represent that Leila with a Z by people who would pronounce it that way, or it could represent that Leila by people who actually pronounce it with a, with a, a D. So, so you have to guess what did this what did this author, what did this scribe uh, mean by that? I just wanted to pr point out one little thing, like you gave the example of khaf la yakunu, right? And, and you said, well, this is often, you leave out the conjunctions between the verbs or whatever. It, here, it's not exactly that. It's, it's la here means lest, right? And it's a particular use of la that is, that is has its own use, and and it reflects the dialect in in classical Arabic. You would probably say "alla yakunu," right? Instead, um, then uh, scholars of Middle Arabic often what they're trying to do uh, beyond just describing what Middle Arabic is is to understand the historical development of dialects. So I guess my question for for Johannes is this, do we know what dialects uh, are reflected in the text? And uh, do we learn anything about the dialects that we didn't know before? Or are we, are we you know, just seeing things that we already knew? Or is there anything interesting that we're learning about the history of the Arabic language while we look at these? I think I'll leave it at that, and thank you. Thank you so much, Devin. Um, I think uh, we can, can we turn it over to Johannes to respond to some of the discussion about Middle Arabic, and if Khulud and, and um, Beatrice have, have things they want to add in response, please uh, let me know. Go ahead, Johannes. Yes, thank you very much. That was great. So many um, important questions and remarks. Um, just, I, I would like to start with a few remarks to what you said, which um, I consider very, um, yeah, very important. Is um, I, I think it, it still does make a change that Middle Arabic um, was used in a manuscript culture, um, 
overwhelmingly often and, and often misrepresented or um, not even considered as any sort of serious idiom, and especially by, by modern editorial practices. And with the um, massive book production in Arabic, which I don't think starts before the late 19th century, really early 20th century, the language becomes really um, standardized toward a national language. And, and with that development, the idea of diglossia just um, um, started to emerge and became, became influential in, in, in the political sense. And I think this political aspect is for me very important. And that's why I guess the, yeah, of course, certain, certain features still, still exist in, in, as you said, in private writing, but I guess on the, on the broader book market, you would still have in the early prints some, some few features of Middle Arabic, but it goes toward the stronger, let's say, Fusa standardization. And I think that is important. And whenever there is a dialect feature, in, for example, in modern literature, um, let's say in, in novels by Nagib Mahfouz or Ilyas Khouri, um, whenever you have a specific um, dialect feature, it's quite conscious to use this as a dialect word. And we don't know about, um, I mean, we should assume that, but we don't know that about um, pre-modern or early modern writers, to what extent they consciously used it. And this is also relating to one of your other um, um, remarks that you made. Um, as you, as you um, mentioned, this one example, and um, yeah, this, this aspect of, we often don't, simply don't know about intentions and also the abilities. So to what extent something could be just um, sort of a sloppy copying or to what extent something unconsciously comes in or the, the writer decides, and this is really difficult to differentiate. And maybe it's not really our, our first task. Our first task is to, to recognize that this is to a large extent idiomatic because we see things reappearing again and again and to list them and then to find ways to describe it and to make sense of it in a different way. And this is what I try to do with this aspect of um, defamiliarization, which um, can be, of course, a bit provocative. Um, important for me here is rather that the text becomes defamiliarized than that the audience that we unfortunately don't know much about, um, I mean, then, then the audience that we probably don't know much about, um, we don't know how familiar they really were, but I just suppose by the amount of, of different, as Khulud and Beatrice have shown, of different texts into one text, we can assume that a lot of people involved in copying and reading out loud and performing and listening knew different, different forms. And it was, it seems sort of the practice and even fun for them to change things um, and make them um, in a different way accessible or to sometimes sound strange to them because they knew a different version. So I'd rather think between, from, from one version to the other, between different texts than from the text to the audience well, that, we, that uh, we don't know much about. Then to your main question, finally, um, the historical development, um, that's, that's something we really need to think about and it's, it's, it's amazingly um, interesting and important. So far, I, I must say, if you compare the corpus of Grillo Dimna to the ones that have been studied in, yeah, I would say to, in, in more depth, the, the Arabian Nights, um, the, the features overall are rather moderate and not um, so strongly going toward um, a strong impact of dialects. But clearly in the, in the manuscript of Ahmed Rabat, of, of whom we know some things, and there's been very interesting, important studies on his library and on his milieu, and he's, he's a someone coming originally from Aleppo and then um, built up his library and his connections in, in Damascus and brought with him Arabian Nights manuscripts. We know, we know more things and he clearly has an impact of Levantine dialect. But um, this, of course, um, having this, this background knowledge, we would assume that already when reading his text and that influences our reading because also we know that some, some um, dialect features uh, the dialect features do not necessarily um, direct the, the author. So an author from a certain region might use dialect features from another one for different reasons, or they were the dominant features in a certain written practice. This is also what Jerome um, Lantin sometimes talks about. So we cannot always be sure that, um, that because of certain features um, that sound, for example, Egyptian, the author must have been necessarily Egyptian. Um, yeah, so, but this is an, yeah. 
an important thing to undertake. Thank you. Great, thank you. And there are some some further questions about Middle Arabic in the chat in the Q and A box that maybe Johannes can um, can answer uh, in in text. We've invited a few of the audience members to join us in the chat. We have um, uh, uh, Stefan Kristonegi from uh, at Exeter. We have uh, Christina Van Vroenbecke from Cambridge, and we have Petra Dungas, who works on children's literature in, in and translated children's literature. And I would invite you to um, to raise your hand either physically or with the feature on Zoom if you know how to. Um, to ask a question. Um, and I believe uh, one of the things that people were very curious about uh, in, the, in the chat is, you know, there are all of these different versions of Khalidu uh, Adzimna. So what version should we read today? Uh, you know, we can't all read the six different versions. Um, so uh, Beatrice, could you could you give us some thought on you know if there was going to be a a single edition of a text, uh, you know, what choices should be made? I know you have some thoughts about this. I have sleepless nights about that. Um, I would like to give different types of readers um, different approaches, but also a certain flexibility. Now, there is certainly um, no critical unique edition. So for the, uh, for the digital aspect, that is the easy answer. We will choose the most diverse manuscripts uh, and make a choice of six or seven, as much as you can read comfortably in columns across the computer screen, and then make it the way that each column uh, can be read in the original or in the translation. So we have everything in English translation and uh, then juxtapose in whichever order, plus uh, the, um, uh, the early medieval European translations. So we will show how we will not make things easy for the uh, colleague, but uh, show how things look in reality. But we also think about the person who wants to just on the night desk read something pleasant. Uh, and here we have cooperated with the Library of Arabic Literature and consulted with Michael Fishbein, who picks one manuscript. It's um, a runaway manuscript from the um, London Continuum. This is a London 4044 that he has translated in beautiful English with the manuscript side by side, but only this manuscript. So you get one uh, completely. And number three, I will in the end um, make uh, in book form um, a selection per chapter from different manuscripts. So give, give one narrative, but go through different manuscripts, uh, something that you can read through in one go. And that is meant for um, uh, non-Arabists who just want to, you know, read text from beginning to end and hold it in their hands or maybe their iPad. Great, thank you. Do, does one of our other panelists have a, have a question at the moment? Uh, Esteban, would you like to ask a question first? First of all, I wanted, I wanted to thank you for, personally, for, for inspiration. I'm, I, I, um, just finishing two, two massive papers on the Khalil Wadimna, one on the evolution of the text and one on decoding. And I was amazed uh, that, that Beatrice used the word decoding. So I think it, it, is, it is encouraging that it's not just my, my bug. And um, yeah, I, uh, also I, I wrote a book on Ibn Amukaffa a while ago in French. And I think this, this convinces me that I should really write another one in English. Uh, and also thank you for this incredible job, whomever ever tried to do a, a little bit of, of text editing knows that this is just incredible and, and killing what you are doing. Um, it's, it's, it's a, and it will be a, a wonderful tool for, for everyone. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I wanted to ask, ask uh, about uh, the, the, the the Khalil Abadimna of Ibn al-Kaffa, what, what we can learn from 
about about it. Uh, it's it's tricky because the 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 Kalila Badim Nava Ibn Abu Kaffa can be the the Kalila Badim Nava Ibn Abu Kaffa had, and then the one what he translated. And I'm also wondering about that some of the differences might go back even to him. Um, uh, we we know that that uh, authors uh, even today, class in music or or in literature, they they might well produce uh, different versions of the same same uh, same same book. So I don't I, I wouldn't exclude this possibility. And then um, that there would be a way to to mark in the in the different text to to see what is the same in each text or or or, or very similar. Probably this should be a question to to Beatrice. And then it was really fascinating to think about the, this question of the of the context for the changes that who made them and why and who were these copyists and. Why did they do this job? Why? Two, two weeks ago, I asked about today, why to do a, uh, how to do and why to do a work with no recognition. Well, for them, it must have been the same. So they must have some, some, some agenda. And I think uh, really, really, Johannes's explanations were really, really interesting to give a replies for this. And, uh, and the minimum is to have, to, well, I think, as an agenda must have been to have, to please the audience. And I, I coined this phrase, or this sentence about to produce to the market, marketplace. And then, then when Devin came in, indeed this marketplace can be literally the market and at the same time the court, uh, and it can be the court. And, as, and what is interesting that the court and the market is not necessarily that far physically and linguistically from each other than, than, than we, we might suppose. And the same people can, can be familiar with both. So, and, and I, I had this comparison in my while actually even before, before while I was listening to, to the to the first two presentations and I was very pleased with that of Johannes that, and that it's a bit like, was there an expectation so uh, to, to produce a new, to uh, a version, um, it, was it like like uh, a baroque or a tarab singer or or violinist who who plays a tune which is known to the to the audience, and then then it is expected that you show off what you can do and you adapt it to the situation, you adapt it to the audience, and 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 you show your own skills um, about this. And this might be perhaps. Um, 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 uh, confirmed by the fact that I think some so we know we know that some copy uh, some uh, libraries had had a number of copies of of Kadila and this make uh, this makes sense that uh, why and how these copies could have been. Yeah, let, let me try to um, and to um, respond briefly and quickly. Thank you for all your thoughts. Uh, your book is always on our shelf in our team library, and we're very grateful to you for uh, g uh, giving this rich resource to us. And um, Ibn Mokafa's version is most of it lost, and the two ends at which you can get is by counter reading the Mahabharata and then comparing chapters that are also in Kalila. And once, I mean, to give an example, in the Lion and um, Jackal uh, chapter, the beginning and the end is totally different from the Mahabharata to the Arabic version based on the Sanskrit. So. Uh, the jackal is not um, doesn't die. He's reconciled, and he comes back to the king. So the king is able to reconcile a mistreated courtier. In the Mahabharata, he goes to heaven. Uh, in the beginning, is completely there is no metempsychosis and other things. Uh, it is it's a long um, prologue on the importance of a good counselor. So so I said, yay, we got him. So not verbatim, but those passages are changed by either the Sasanian editor or in the Mokafa, but somewhere around there. Uh, 
That's really um, great. Um, I was wondering if we could just get Christine in here uh, to to put in um, a question or her two cents. We have another uh, Christine Van Roenbecke who has also written a book on a version of Kalilu Adzimna in Persian. Um, Christine, thank you for, for coming. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Thank you all, all of you for this fantastic job that you're, you're producing. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Having, having written my book a few years ago, uh, I felt very, very lonely. And so it's, it's absolutely exciting and amazing to see that, you know, Khalil and Dimna is, is really uh, alive again and the, the research is, is thriving. Um, it's also a little bit, um, I mean, listening to the, the reports that you've been producing on, on that amazing work you've been doing, um, it's, a bit, it's a bit frightening because I just feel that we're not very closer to uh, the, the Urs, the original Kalil and Dimna. It's we, what we are discovering, and, and thank you for that, because that's really um, um, respecting uh, th this text or this tradition, as uh, Johannes prefers to, uh, it to be called, it's your your research project is welcoming, is embracing all the differences, all the versions that exist, and and, and the way uh, Devin Stewart said, it's it's really turning its back on that very damaging uh, attitude of you know everything that does not really. Uh, um, is not the same in, in all the different versions is, 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 is wrong, is contamination, is, is, is something that we must forget. So thank you so much for uh, uh, looking at, at the texts as, uh, as they really are. So what, what I come up with as an uh, interrogation is this sort of, per maybe the word is too strong, perverse game of all the authors, rewriters, copies, whatever you want to call them. But I think we can really talk about rewriters in, in, in many cases, even if they are anonymous and we, and we don't know who they were or, or for whom they wrote. But what I, what I feel is that they are playing with this, this game of, you know, this is a very uh, old, fantastic text. And by saying that and by stating um, you know, it, it comes from India, Sanskrit, uh, wise people have been writing it. You know, that um, I have questions about, you know, the reality of, of, of this story, but let's leave that aside. But by stressing that, they seem to say, well, you know, this is a text we need to respect. This is a text we should not change one little, you know, comma there because everything is so old and so venerable and so wise. And actually what we see in practice over and over and over again, whether it's in the Arabic tradition, in the Persian tradition, is that the copies of free are actually told, the reader is told, use your brains, think about it, go slowly and be creative in your, in your use of the text, in your understanding of the text. And these three writers are being creative. So they are, they are really turning their back to this respect they should feel for an ancient text. And they create again and again. But then at the same time, what I discovered here today, when you were explaining all these uh, these uh, continua between texts and, and all the differences there are between texts and how some copyists are using other manuscripts just for, for little bits of phrases. So at the same time, they're aware of the, the value of other manuscripts that they can lay their hands on. And they very often want to collate everything that is useful, every new interpretation that has been done by earlier copyists, not to lose that and to integrate it in their new copy, in their new creation. So yes, Kalila and Dimna is amazing. It's a life-changing experience when you start working on it. It's not going to be finished, Beatrice. You're going to continue, you know, in your dreams, in your life, for the rest of your, your uh, uh, career, I'm afraid, and, and all of you will, will you know, but it's, um, it's, it's wonderful to see how um, creative people have been asked to be, readers have been asked to be, and as an aside and a little, uh, you know, uh, just a little smile to Beatrice, what you are going to produce as editions is continuing exactly what your copyists and your manuscript uh, creators have been doing. You're doing the same. 
that, but that's the only thing we can do with Kalila and Dimna is to try to respect the text and come up with um, inspiration, creation, and make something out of it that can be useful for our, our public, our audience. I think that's really, really fascinating. I've always found it very interesting the way that this cross copying what used to be called contamination functions in Kalila and Dimna. Because it, in other texts, when you do mokabala, when you ch check your text against other texts, you often put the variations in the margins. And it seems like here, they're just being brought into the middle, which I think is such a fascinating uh, process. Uh, Petra, I wanted to see one more time if we could hear your, uh, your voice. If not, I will pose a question in your, on your behalf. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please uh, go ahead with your question. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to hear these different approaches and it has inspired me to try harder to find uh, German publishers for Kalila and Dimna. But I, I think I, I still need some, some help uh, from others to, uh, to, uh, to find a good preface for, for the German children. I have to think more about it because the version I found is, is very good, but uh, children in the Arab uh, countries, they know already what Kalina and Dimna is, but the children in Germany, they don't know it. And if they are only presented with some stories and they don't know anything about the frame stories, they do not understand uh, all of this. this. <laughs> So I need to study more about it and read more about Kalila and Dimna, and I hope to find a good Arabic version uh, for adults. Um, Professor Gründler told about um, uh, Michael Fischbein, who is working uh, on, a, on a translation and also an edition. Uh, is this a completed work or is this ongoing? Thank you so much, Patrick. Beatrice, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to report that uh, it is almost complete and is, is going to the printers very soon. So you'll have it uh, soon. And uh, Library of Arabic Literature, as a courtesy, put their Arabic text version free online. You can download it and you can either buy the entire book or get the um, only the English translation of that. And that being said, I'd be... <laughs> Very glad to help you and work with you on your further project. I have not yet responded to oh. your email, but we can yes. after this definitely communicate. That yeah, I mean, I think it's really happy. <laughs> as was mentioned in the in the chat, there is a sort of part of the project that's looking at the use of Kalila with Dimna in education. Um, so there, there, there is some thought being given to this in the project, and I think that this will be uh, sort of a fruitful jumping off point for things in the future because this is the end of our series of events. Um, but uh, we've had a real great chance to uh, hear from a lot of different people all over the world and chat with people in the chat box and follow up over email. So please do follow up with us, uh, follow up with the presenters uh, about what you've heard, about what you're interested in. We will take a look at the chat box and the Q&A and respond to some of those questions as well. Uh, and we look forward to crossing paths in some future world where we are not all sitting in front of our computer screens when we talk about this, but can actually uh, chat in, in person. Um, thank you again to, uh, to everyone to the Columbia Global Center and uh, stay well. And we hope to see you at a future event some, somewhere else. <laughs>